Hi guys. Uh, so my name is Or, co-founder and CTO at Skyline AI. Uh, prior to Skyline, uh, I helped co-found a company called Streamrail, which was a video optimization company acquired by Iron Source about two years ago. And before that, I was a cybersecurity and privacy researcher at AVG Innovation Labs in Amsterdam. And in recent years, I've been writing mostly in Go. Uh, you can check some of my open source work on my GitHub. Uh, and I've been using serverless and pass uh, for quite a few years now, so since the early days of uh, Google App Engine. So, quick story, about 10 years ago, I used to manage R&D uh, at a bank, you know, that thing we had before Bitcoin. Uh, and um, one time, the bank came out with this campaign where they wanted to offer qualified customers uh, a specific product that they were out with. My team was tasked with generating the code to help with this campaign. So this was a two-phase uh, two uh, process. The first application was, uh, was needed, was had to connect to the bank's database to prepare a list of contacts. And the second application had to scan the contacts file and generate phone call activities on the bank's CRM. Once they were, once they were on the bank's CRM system, uh, they would reach the phone call, the, the call center, and people would get calls. So, how do you actually, back in the day, we used good old cron, so cron, the Unix style scheduling, like, uh, scheduling application. And back in the day, uh, cron did not, still does not support dependencies, right? So you can schedule processes, but the only way for you to actually signal cron uh, to run one process after the other is by doing what we call the cron guessing game. So you have this process, you know that it takes about one minute to run. Um, so you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to go crazy and I'm going to like schedule the next process for like 30 minutes after that and surely it's, it's going to work. Well, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. In our case, on the first day of the campaign, this actually worked. But on the, se on the second day of the campaign, something really interesting happened. One of the tables uh, was locked and because of the lock, the first application, the one which was supposed to fetch the contacts, was pretty much stuck forever. The second application starts running. It actually finds the contacts file. However, the contacts file uh, is partial. So it, it has the phone numbers, but it doesn't have, for example, the government ID of the contacts. And this resulted in a really interesting bug where hundreds of phone call activities were generated on the, on the call center, all aimed towards the same person. So the, the person got about 50 calls per second from teenagers in the call center during that day. You can imagine that he wasn't very happy about that. So fast forward like 10 years after that, um, uh, we founded Skyline AI. So Skyline AI uh, is basically a real estate investment technology platform using AI and data in order to make smarter real estate investment decisions. And the way it works is by basically connecting to dozens of different data sources. We have over, and over 130 by now. Uh, some of them are everything from satellite images to uh, Excel files we get from funds. Uh, to just scraping from the web. So it's pretty varied. And each and one of these data sources is uh, acquired some, with something with an application which is called an ETL. So while the different sources uh, come in different forms, for example, an HTML file is downloaded, this is the extract phase, then it's been transformed into JSON and then it's finally loaded to the, data to the database. Or if it's a PDF file uh, which is downloaded and then it's um, we have some, some, uh, some code to extract features, features from that and then this loads into the database. The sources are really different, but the pattern is the same. So it's always extract, transform, and load. Now each of these ETLs in, at Skyline is a standalone Go application which is Dockerized. So they can run inside Docker containers. Um, and our scheduling needs are such that we have these things running all the time. So some daily, some monthly, some weekly and we have dependencies between them, and we don't want to do it the good old cron guessing game style. Um, so we want to make sure that when process Y runs, it's only after and immediately after process X finishes. We also want to be able to use concurrency. So if I want to get the weather data, uh, it's not dependent on getting the crime rate data. So I can try to fetch both in parallel, and then when both are finished, I can call my machine learning server to generate predictions. And this kind of process can become pretty complicated pretty quick. So remember, we have about 130 different data sources, some of them dependent, some of them take a long while, some take a short while. So pretty soon it was pretty obvious that we're going to have to use a system to manage this execution. Uh, this construct, it's, it's referred to as DAG, Directed Acyclic Graph, 
which basically means that you have a bunch of nodes connected with edges <coughs> and no loops. So A goes to B, but B cannot go back to A because the, the execution will, would be infinite in this case. So we have found a solution for, for DAG execution, which I'm going to show you in a minute. But even when we did that, we still have had a monolith issue because imagine if you had something like a smart cron that could uh, basically uh, have dependencies and things like that, you would still run on the same container where you have cron all of your ETLs. And this is not a good idea because some ETLs actually require a lot of memory. Some of them require tons of CPU. And if you use the same machine to run all of them, you end up with this huge, huge monster machine that you, know, you, you really don't want to have one like that. Um, further, um, this machine is a pretty lonely server, right? Because remember, ETLs are scheduled. It, they only run like once a day, once a month. So this means keeping the monster machine idle most of the time, which you also want to avoid. So at this stage, we set out to look for a platform to solve all of these needs. Um, we, uh, the first platform we saw was Apache Airflow. Uh, so Airflow, it's a DAG execution engine developed originally at Airbnb, which actually shares some of our engineering challenges when it comes to collecting data about real estate. Um, we found it to be a bit over-engineered, so it's really complex, uh, which is good and bad. Uh, however, it's still in the Apache incubation phase, which means that it's got some severe maturity issues and didn't work too well for us. Next up, um, we tried Luigi. So Luigi is a Python component library. It's much simpler than Airflow. Uh, it's written in Python over Java, which is always good, uh, almost always. Um, and it's, but yet it is imperative, which means that if you want to change the DAG, you want to remove a node, you want to you know, create a new, a new graph um, uh, from beginning, you have to basically use, use Python code to do that. So we ended up developing our own platform. We call it GAD. It's a directed uh, acyclic graph execution engine, which is declarative. So it's got a web server built in uh, and an API that you can use to create new graphs, uh, remove nodes, add, uh, add them, uh, query for logs and whatever. It's extensible using Go. So if you really want to change the code, you could do that uh, with Go. It's cost effective because it is serverless enabled as you will soon see. Uh, and it's going to be open sourced in a few days once I get rid of a few embarrassing lines of code. Um, so how do we use GAD to create a graph? Um, so there is a metadata schedules API endpoint. All you have to do is curl it with the graph that you want to create. For instance, uh, this simple graph. So we're going to echo A, then we're going to echo B and C in parallel. And then if everything works, we're going to echo D. So that graph basically translates into this simple JSON file. Uh, you can see the schedule is to run every uh, two minutes. You can see the graph. So we have commands there. Each command, each node basically has a name. So A, a command text. So this is a command that runs uh, in, the, uh, in the containers bash. Um, so in this case, echo. And then the parameters, in this case, A. Same for B. So echo B, echo C, echo D. You can notice that uh, the B, C, and D nodes also have a dependencies attributes called depths, which means which is basically the way we implement the, the dependencies in the graph. So, okay, we now have a pretty cool way to create uh, DAGs and execute them. We solve this problem, but what about the monolith problem? So echoing stuff is pretty easy. It's not, not really memory or uh, memory intensive. You can run it on the same execution server, but in reality, we are dealing with ETLs, which require a lot more than that. Um, so in this phase, remember that all of our ETLs were standalone Go applications which were dockerized. So this, the solution we, we looked for was a way to run them serverlessly uh, to get rid of the ops as much as possible and also to enable a thin, uh, thin machine, thin container to run the execution server itself. So at this point, we found Hypershell. So Hypershell is a serverless container platform which uh, you know, is basically another way of saying uh, you can use Docker almost the same as you are used to only not worry about where the container runs, uh, to the extent that you don't even have to schedule a cluster. So it's really different from something like Kubernetes, if you guys have used it. It's really, really uh, simple to manage. And just to give you guys an example, so coming back to the echoing stuff, uh, in, in the forum example, we echo A. If you would do it versus a Debian shell, you would docker run Debian shell minus C echo A. To do the same with Hyper, all you have to do after some initial setup is just replace the Docker word with Hyper. Uh, and the great thing is that the Hyper CLI basically 
emulate the Docker API completely. So everything that you're used to getting from the Docker command, like the logs, uh, would, would work with Hyper as well. Um, you could also use, so Hyper could do anything for you. You can just, you know, Hyper run whatever, but if you really like to, you can actually choose where the containers would run. In our case, this, uh, this actually makes sense because our data warehouse all is a BigQuery on Google, so we want our ETLs to run there as well. Um, you could choose the size of the containers, uh, so anything from nano containers with only 64 meg RAM uh, to really big ones with a few gigs. And as you would expect from a serverless platform, it's got, server, uh, it's got per second billing. So you only pay for the time that your container runs. So sh long story short, it's basically a tailor-made way of executing each and every node in the graph. So every node gets exactly the resources it needs, and you only pay for the time it runs. Um, Okay, so now let's check out an example of how to use the actual GAD server I just told you about with the serverless thing. So with Hyper, uh, we ha we're going to have two key differences from the previous simple example where we just echo A, B, and C, and D. Uh, the first one is that it's going to run serverless. So the GAD server will run with Docker, but the commands are going to run with Hyper. Uh, and the second difference is that we're going to have node C fail uh, explicitly so instead of echoing C, we're going to just return a non-zero status code from the container, just to illustrate the concept, the, the notion of DAG. So this is how we start the server. You just Docker run it. Um, and you could see that uh, basically uh, the server is up. The API server for GAD is up as well. Now we're basically going to just curl a JSON onto the metadata schedules endpoint. Um, but this time, instead of just echoing, it's going to work with Hyper going to trigger it. Once this triggers, uh, you will see log execu execution logs uh, on Slack. You can find deeper logs on GAD's database, if you like. All right, so we have the thing running. Uh, and you could see that the execution started um, roughly now. Um, and you can see all of the commands that are starting. So hyper run Debian echo A, Debian echo, echo B exit 5 for C to have it fail, and then hyper run echo D. So everything runs remotely. We don't really care about, you know, what it does. Okay, log execution complete. And go back to Slack. And you can see that, um, well, node C has failed expect, uh, as expected. And you can see that the, the D command from, the, uh, from branch forward was not even attempted to run. So this is the notion of DAG. For each and every command, you can see the duration it took right on Slack. And if you want uh, deeper logs, like what, what was written to the STD out and all of these things, you can use GAD's uh, internal server, internal database to do that. Um, so a few conclusions. Lambda is cool. We're using it as well in our front-end web application. But it's not a good fit for ETLs, right? Because it's, it's made, it's designed for short-lived requests. And ETLs typically take anywhere between a few minutes to a few hours. HyperShell is a great way to enjoy serverless capabilities with Docker containers, so it's super easy to use and very effective. Docker is great for application isolation, uh, and ETLs are no different. It's not a good idea to use plain old cron to schedule ETLs that depend on each other. And it's also not a great idea to use a monolith application server to run all of your ETLs. And finally, if you have any uh, DAG flows in your application, whether or not they are ETLs, you probably want to check out one of these platforms, which are pretty good solutions to solving this kind of like common problem. Thank you, guys. <laughs> any questions? Why did you choose Hyper over Quarkit? So we basically started using uh, Hyper almost six months ago, which is I think was when around when where Fargate was released. Uh, and we already had some experience with Hyper and didn't want to get into a new system. I think that uh, Fargate uh, does require quite a bit more configuration, but it is correct that the two are quite comparable. All right, cheers guys, thank you.